Hello, and welcome to Bridge Online. My name's Paul. And I'm Bethany, and we're so glad that you're here today. We would love to know where you're tuning in from right now, so why don't you let us know in the chat? And if this is your first time joining us, or you've been with us for a while, we're so glad that you're tuning in. The Bridge is, is a church that exists to be with Jesus and become like Him for the sake of the world, and that's exactly what we're gonna do today. So as we dive into a time in God's Word together, we pray that this blesses you and that it allows all of us to abide with and be transformed by Jesus both today and every day. And if it's your first time tuning in, we are so excited that you're here. If you could do just one thing, drop a waving emoji in the chat right now. One of our online hosts would love to reach out and say hi. And if this isn't your first time, will you help me welcome everyone with a big bridge welcome? We know that we do this together. So after you do that, go ahead and share the stream with a family member or friends. You never know who might need to hear today's message. So as we enter into a time of worship, I wanna take a moment to encourage you wherever you find yourself right now, whether that's your bedroom, your dorm room, your living room, or your office, take a moment to allow this to be a sanctuary where you can be with Jesus. Set aside any distractions, get a copy of God's Word ready, maybe grab a notebook and a pen so that you can take notes as you follow along. Yeah. Remember, we're not doing this alone. So at any point, if something encourages you, you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat so we can do this journey together. And on that note, let's dive into God's Word together.
church, lift that up, sing, you are worthy.
eternity um, and only because of what Christ has done for us so let's give him praise this morning because he is worthy amen well church we just want to say welcome we are so glad that you are here whether you've been here for the last 20 years or if today is your first day we just want to say welcome home um, so as you're finding your seat will you turn to someone and just say that you are glad that they are here today to be with you this morning. My name is Randy, and I'm a part of the team here at The Bridge, and I want to welcome everyone joining us here at Spring Hill, as well as those of you joining us online. We're so glad that you're here. I want to welcome also a special welcome to those of you who are here for the very first time. We're so glad that you're here. I would love the chance to get to meet you after the service. I'm going to be hanging out in the living room, which is the space in the lobby with the couches. Come find me after, and I would love to connect with you. Here at The Bridge, we believe that whether you are new or newer here, we all have a next step that we can take. And one of the best ways for you to connect is through Open House, which is coming up in just two weeks. Open House is a great way for you to learn more about who we are as a church, what we believe. You'll get a chance to meet some of the staff as well as connect with others. So if you'd like to sign up to join us for Open House, you can do that by going to bridge.tv slash next on your phone right now and fill out our digital connect card. Or you can grab 
grab one of the cards in the seat back in front of you. And as you're filling that out, just check the box that says, I'd like to join the next open house. And someone from our team will reach out to you with details. Every week, as we gather, we worship God through our generosity, believing that everything that he has given us is first a gift. And so we're honored to give back to him. And it's because of your generosity that we are seeing transformational work done both here, near, and far. And so if you call the bridge home and you would like to give today, there's some instructions on the screen, as well as in just a moment, a bucket's gonna be passed down the row. Feel free to drop your gift along with the connect card in that bucket. You guys, Easter is one week away. Who's excited for Easter? We cannot wait to celebrate with you. And we are believing that there are gonna be hundreds of people that are gonna walk through the doors of our Spring Hill location, our Columbia location, and online for the very first time. And we know that it is going to be a powerful weekend with an inspirational message of hope. And so as we're preparing for all these guests, I have a missional ask for you. We know that it's most likely that our new guests will be joining us on Easter Sunday morning for one of our AM services. And as you look around, the room is packed and it's gonna be even more packed next week. And we know that there are gonna be people that are coming here that have never heard the message of hope in Jesus that we know so well. And so we wanna create space for them to experience that in a a distraction-free environment. And so my ask for you today is that if you call the bridge home, would you consider joining us for one of our PM services on Easter? By you making that move to the PMs, it's gonna free up a parking spot, it's gonna free up a seat for them. We don't want them to have to go to our additional seating to hear the message. And so by you moving to one of the PM services, that will create a space for them to experience this message of hope that we believe could be transformative for their eternities. So I hope you'll join me. We have PM services at 1 p.m., 3 p.m., and 5 p.m. here at Spring Hill. And I can't wait to see you at one of those PM services. All right, well, on that note, let's check out Bridge News to see what else is happening here at the bridge on Easter. Hey, Bridge family. My name is Rachel from our team here at the bridge. And to everyone joining us in person or online, welcome home. We are so glad you're here. As you know, Easter is only one week away and we're getting ready for a special weekend together where we can celebrate as a church family. It'll all kick off on Friday, March 29th when we gather at both of our campuses and online for Good Friday services. In Spring Hill and Columbia, there will be a special lobby experience walking you through the journey to the cross and it'll be a meaningful time for all ages to experience. Then we'll head right into Easter services on Sunday, March 31st with multiple service times across Spring Hill, Columbia, and online. All the dates, times, and details are ready for you at bridge.tv slash Easter so you can start making plans to join us and most importantly, to invite someone to come along with you to hear an incredible message of hope. We are so excited to celebrate together and we'd love to see you there. If you've been around the bridge for a few weeks or maybe you're checking things out for the first time today, we know that finding the church that you call home is a big decision. If that's where you're at, let me tell you about an environment we have built specifically for you called Open House. Open House is the way that we welcome you into our home and help you to find out more about who we are, what we do, and how you can become part of the family. So if you're curious but ready to be connected, we'd love to save you a seat for the next Open House coming up on April 7th. Get ready to meet some of our leaders and others who call the bridge their home and bring all of your questions. We welcome them all. Whatever your next step is, Open House is a great place to start, and you can RSVP at bridge.tv slash open house anytime. We'll save you a spot, and we'll see you there. To all the kids that are joining us in person or online today with your family, we are so glad you're here. Parents, Bridge Kids is happening right now, and it's the best environment designed specifically for your kids to learn about Jesus in a way they best understand. We also have a family lounge with a live stream of the service, so if you have to step out for any reason, you won't miss a thing. On that note, we know God has something special in store for us in his word today. So grab your Bibles and let's prepare our hearts to receive together. All right, Bridge fam, good morning. How are we doing today? 
Hey, good to be with you. Hey, if we haven't met yet, my name is Corey, and I'm part of our team here at The Bridge. Uh, great to worship with you uh, here in the room. And if you're tuning in online at our Columbia campus, uh, Murray County Jail, Perry County Jail, I want to say welcome to you as well. Can we welcome our church family joining us from all over? Love you guys. Hey, we're about to open up God's Word and study together, but before we do, we always love to kick off our time uh, in prayer, and one of the best ways we know how is uh, through a posture that looks like this, and this is coming to God and saying, uh, God, I walked in here uh, carrying some stuff, and uh, maybe I need to let go of something I'm carrying, and so I'm opening up my hands uh, to let go of whatever that might be. I'm also here to receive, God, what it is you would have for me. So if you feel comfortable, you can open up your hands like this as we kick off our time together. Father, thank you for uh, this gathering of people. Thank you that you know the names and stories of every person gathered here today. And as we open up your word, God, I pray that you would show us the beauty and the power and majesty of Jesus. And Jesus, as we uh, celebrate you as king, uh, God, I pray that you would remove whatever is on the throne of our heart. Uh, if there's something we do need to let go of and dethrone, uh, may it be so. And we stand expectant, God, that you would speak, that you would conform us more to the image of Jesus. Uh, be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the passage we're going to be looking at today is in Mark chapter 11. If you've got a Bible, you can turn there. Uh, this is one of the stranger passages in the New Testament. If it were a Friends episode, it would be called the one where Jesus curses a fig tree and flips some tables, okay? Uh, and for some of you, that makes you uncomfortable. Some of you are like, I don't like the idea of Jesus flipping tables. Others of you, this like Mark eleven fifteen 15 is your life verse. You've got it tattooed on your bicep, uh, and you are just waiting for that time when somebody says, John, I know you're angry, but what would Jesus do just so you can say, well, he might flip this table right here, okay? Like, that's your dream scenario. You size up tables when you walk into a room, okay? So that's the table flipping, and then there's the fig tree part of the story, and that's just straight up strange. I remember when I was a brand new Christian, I was 17 years old, finishing up high school, and somebody had given me a uh, paperback copy of the New Testament, and I'd never read it before, and I started digging into it, and my friend who led me to Christ said, if you have any questions, let me know. And I was asking him approximately 47 questions a day, and uh, throughout the day. And so he goes, why don't you just batch these together? And then we'll meet like at the end of the day and then walk through some of them. And so I would ask him anything that came to mind. I was a brand, brand new Christian, didn't grow up in the church. So I was like, uh, hey, uh, Jesus didn't get married. Like, why is that? Like, could he have gotten married if he wanted to? Like, he's Jesus. I don't know. Or uh, Jesus handpicked all of his disciples, but why did he pick Judas if he knew that Judas was going to betray him. And, and then I asked about this fig tree scene. And I was like, can you explain this to me? And he's like, ah, oh, yes. I have no idea. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, I've been to seminary, I've been following Jesus for 18 years or so, and uh, I, if you had asked me three weeks ago, can you explain the fig tree thing, I probably would have had a hard time explaining it. So we learn as we go, even your pastors, okay? Uh, if you don't know the story, here's the gist of it. Jesus wakes up one day, he's hungry, he sees a fig tree off in the distance, he goes up to it looking for something to eat, he finds no fruit on it, and he says, you will die now. And then he walks away. And that, like, that's it. And you're like, what on earth is that doing here? Uh, most of us, we read that and we kind of like, oh, I'm moving right along. And we just kind of wish it wasn't there. Like, it's right up there with like Fight Club and Bruno in the list of things we just don't talk about, right? It's like in our don't talk about at church list. Uh, but we're going to talk about it today. Is that, is that okay? We're going to talk about the weird stuff because uh, that's part of, you know, walking through the Bible is you talk about uh, the weird stuff. Today is Palm Sunday. Happy Palm Sunday, by the way. Uh, Palm Sunday is the day that kicks off what's known as Holy Week, which is the final week of Jesus' ministry leading up to his death and resurrection. Up until this point in his life, Jesus has spent the last three years teaching, healing, and training up his disciples. And you know that most of Jesus' ministry, he's sort of held the fact that he is the king kind of close to his chest. He's like done miracles and be like, don't tell anybody that I, that, about who I am. But now is time for Jesus to enter Jerusalem and show who he really is, which is king. So he tells his disciples, go get a colt, ride a donkey, uh, and I'm going to ride into town. And people come, and they throw their jackets down, and they wave palm branches, which is where we get the name Palm Sunday. And they shout things like, Hosanna, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and his identity is out. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem as king. It's called the triumphal entry. That's where most Palm Sunday uh, services park, is on Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And if you want a message like that, it's not today, but I taught this same uh, weekend last year. And if you want a message on the entry into Jerusalem, we've got a link for you, okay? So bridge.tv slash Palm Sunday, and you can uh, go back and listen to last year's message about the entry. Today, we're going to focus on something different. We're going to focus on what Jesus did right 
after he came into town. In other, in other words, what did he come into town to do? So with that in mind, we're going to pick it up in Mark chapter 11, verse 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Okay, so sort of a strange anticlimax, right? Jesus has just like lots of fanfare. People are shouting his name and praising him, and he walks into town. The crowds kind of dissipate. He goes into the temple courts, looks around, and then just turns around and walks out of town. Sort of strange, right? There's a, a sense of like, what's happening here? Even a sense of like foreboding about what's going to happen next. If you listen closely, you can almost hear Jesus say, I'll be back. All right? That was, that was dumb. All right. Uh, so Jesus turns on his heels. Disciples follow him out to Bethany, which is where Mary and Martha and Lazarus, his friends, lived. So he very well could have spent the night at their house. Verse 12. The next day, as they're leaving Bethany, so they're leaving Bethany, coming back into Jerusalem, Jesus was hungry. Do you know that Jesus got hungry? He's like us. He's human, right? Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went out to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, uh, in the Greek it's literally he replied to the tree, whatever that's worth, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Okay, so this is weird. It's weird for several reasons. The first reason it's weird is because after Jesus says these words to the fig tree, it withers shortly thereafter, okay? There are roughly 37 different distinct miracles in the Gospels, the biographies of Jesus in the, in the New Testament, and all of them are miracles of healing, of restoration. So he goes about doing things like teaching and heal, healing the sick and the blind and the chronically ill and casting out demons, feeding thousands of people, everywhere except for right here. This is what's been called a miracle of destruction, and the only one. Jesus uses his power to destroy something. That's weird. The second reason this is weird is it's the last miracle in Mark's gospel, aside from the resurrection, which is sort of the big one, okay? But this is sort of a weird note for Mark to end on as far as miracles go in his gospel. The third reason this is weird is that it looks like Jesus reacts in rage to a fig tree that has done nothing wrong. After all, we're told that it doesn't bear fruit because it's not the what? It's not the season for figs. Okay, so what's happening here? People have been befuddled by this. A lot of people have said, okay, I guess that's just hangry Jesus, you know? We're just going to call it what it is. We all have our bad days. Maybe this is it. But this has been really off-putting for lots and lots of people because it seems off-brand for what we know about Jesus. In fact, some people have written off Jesus entirely because of this episode. Uh, one man named T.W. Manson said, this is a tale of miraculous power wasted in the service of ill temper. For the supernatural energy employed to blast the unfortunate tree might have been more usefully expended in forcing a crop of figs out of season. You catch what he's saying? Like, Jesus, you could have made figs up here on the tree. You kind of have done stuff like that before. Why'd you have to go and kill the tree, Jesus, right? Maybe you can see where Manson's coming from here. So what's happening? Uh, first of all, even though it may look at a glance like this is just a random episode, if you spend any amount of time reading the Bible, you know that the gospel writers are very particular about the stories they tell about Jesus' life. And what looks like a coincidence or a random episode is rarely such a thing. If you pay attention, context matters. Jesus is making a connection, or Mark is making a connection about what Jesus did the night before at the temple and what Jesus is doing here at the fig tree. So the night before, Jesus enters the temple, and what does he do? He looks around. And then, the next morning, he sees a fig tree, and he goes up to it, and he looks it over to observe. And what he finds is a tree that has lots of leaves, but no fruit. And he curses it, saying, may no one ever eat of you again. And the tricky part is, this detail that Mark includes, because he says the reason why it didn't have any figs is because it wasn't the season for it. And this has left a lot of Bible readers and Bible scholars just puzzled. A lot of ink has been spilled over trying to understand this passage. So here are two sort of main explanations that I came across that Bible scholars have put forth, okay? The first one is that while it was not the season for fully ripe figs, those who know things about fig trees that I don't know would say that 
around this time of year, there still would have been early small figs on the tree if it was a healthy tree. And they wouldn't have been delicious, but they would have been something to eat if you were looking for something on a day you were hungry like this. But if you approach the tree and there was nothing on it, not even the little figs, that would be an indication that that tree was not going to bear any fruit that year at all. The second explanation is sort of a general observation about fruit-bearing trees in general. So uh, Jesus sees that this tree is a fig tree and it's got lots of leaves and a fruit tree that has lots of leaves is going to be a promising meal, okay? And he walks up to it and if a person walks up to a leafy fruit tree and finds no fruit, it's going to be a disappointment. So either way, what's happening is that Jesus sees this tree from a distance, and upon getting a closer look, what he finds is this, a tree that overpromises and underdelivers. And after finding no fruit, he declares, you're going to be forever fruitless. Now, remember what Mark is doing here. Remember the context. Jesus assesses the temple, and then he assesses the fig tree. He then curses the fig tree and goes back to the temple. Dun, 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 right? Here we go. Verse 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered into the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. All right, so there it is. There's our famous passage of Jesus flipping tables. So what's happening here? Some background, especially if you're not a church person, might be helpful. So uh, the temple essentially is this. The temple is the place on earth where God dwelled with people. If you know the storyline of the Bible, it's God created us to be in fellowship with us. But something disrupted that picture, and that was sin. And sin separated us from God because God cannot dwell with a sinful people. So the whole rest of the storyline of the Bible is essentially God pursuing us and chasing us down and making a way for us to be reunited with him. And the temple for a long time was the solution to how can a holy God dwell in the midst of a sinful people. And the reason why was because of this thing called the animal sacrifice system. And it seems odd to us, but here it was, it was actually a provision of grace because what God did is he said, sin deserves death as a penalty. But instead of you dying, I will allow one to die in your place so that you and me can come together. So that is what was happening at the temple. That's what the sacrificial system is about. I want to show you the layout of the temple uh, at the time of Jesus. This is known as Herod's temple because the temp temple uh, underwent kind of different iterations. I want you to see that there's divisions about who is allowed where. So there was different courts. The outer courts were where Gentiles, non-Jews could come. That'd be like most of us in this room, okay? Then, slightly inside, then Jewish women. Congratulations, women. You make it just inside. Then there's Jewish men, and then there's priests. And the priests would enter in here, and then in the very inner room was the Holy of Holies. That's where God's undiluted presence dwelled, and that's where one high priest could go once a year to make atonement for God's people. So I want you to see this, and I want you to see that this was actually not God's intended design. If you read the Old Testament and the, the layout of the temple, it's very detailed, there was only one division originally, and that was between the priests and everyone else. Meaning all of this was man-made lines of division over time that eventually became walls to separate people and make it very clear who was in and who was out. What we see happening in the temple is a tendency that we have actually not outgrown as a church community. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. famously said, it's appalling that in Christian America, the most segregated hour of the week is 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. We still have a hard time with this one, don't we? That's the layout of the temple. I want you to see the separation. Then there's what happened in the temple. So this is the sacrificial system. There were different kinds of sacrifices, but the main one was to atone for sin or to pay the penalty for sin. An animal would stand in as a substitute for a guilty person. And by the way, that's all of us, Scripture says. So uh, when a person would offer an animal, here's what you have to understand. Uh, there was an animal sacrifice and there was a temple tax. You had to have the right animal and you had to have the right currency. So very specific regulations around what kind of animal could be brought. It had to be without blemish, a perfect animal, okay, no defect, defects. It had to be uh, exactly the right age. And uh, lots and lots of people would be coming this time of year, Passover, 
uh, this Passover week, thousands, tens and tens of thousands of people. Uh, Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, uh, tells us that on a Passover right around this time of Jesus, he estimated that there were 256 and a half thousand lambs sacrificed in one week quarter million lambs. That's a lot of animals. So it wasn't feasible for people to bring perfect, without blemish, just the right age animals from all over the place into Jerusalem. And so people would set up these booths, merchants, to sell animals that fit the bill. Okay? That was the animals. Then there was the temple tax. And so there were, uh, it was required that they, this would be paid in Jewish currency. Okay? It was a scriptural mandate. And, but most people had Roman currency. That's what they worked with. And so as a service, again, to people who were coming from afar, they would say, give us your Roman currency and we'll give you an exchange for Jewish currency so you can pay your temple tax. So that's kind of what's happening. All of that is background information in this scene that's happening. So with that in mind, Jesus enters into the temple courts and he's less than happy. He's just cursed a fig tree. He's coming in hot and he starts flipping tables and driving people out. Now, the word that Mark uses for driving people out is the same word that he uses elsewhere for Jesus driving demons out of people. This is not a gentle push. In fact, uh, John gives us this nice little detail that Jesus entered the uh, temple and uh, made a whip out of cords to kind of speed the process along, okay? So what is going on here? Why is Jesus so angry about what's happening? Why, why is he so angry that he looks nothing like the Jesus we see elsewhere in the Gospels, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Why is he so angry he's got a whip in his hand and he's driving people away? Many people think that what is happening here is a sense of like price gouging. People are coming from out of town, right? They've got the booth set up and so they're charging way more for animals or maybe they're jipping people on the currency exchange. It's sort of like if you park near an airport, you rent a car and like there's one gas station near the airport and they charge like $10 a gallon, right? Maybe that's what's going on. Maybe that is the case. But that can't be the only thing, because here's the deal. As I'm looking at this passage, Jesus drives out not just those who were selling, but those who were buying as well. So it's both and. So what's happening? Verse 17 really helps us understand why Jesus is so upset. Here's what it says. He's just <laughs> got done flipping, whipping, okay? And as he taught them, which I just think is funny, he's like got a whip in his hand. He's like, all right, teaching moment. Okay. And like, which is just, I love picturing it. He says this, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. House of prayer for all nations, den of robbers. These are two quotations from the Old Testament that explain why Jesus is angry. So why, what makes Jesus so angry that he's flipping tables? Exclusion and presumption. Okay. One at a time. This quote from Isaiah Jesus is so important. Jesus says, my house will be a, a house of prayer for who? All nations. And technically, all nations were allowed into the temple. But we saw that if you were a Gentile, a non-Jew, the only place you were allowed to go was in the very outer edges of the court. And where do you think the merchants and the money exchangers were setting up shop? In the outer courts. After all, it was just where the Gentiles were allowed. Now imagine if based on your ethnicity, the only place that you were allowed to worship and pray was like at the self-checkout area at Kroger. Imagine trying to focus there. Do you begin to see why Jesus is so angry? A place that was supposed to welcome all nations had been a place not of inclusion, but a place of exclusion, a place that was very clear about who belonged and who was second class. And so just like Jesus, who was hungry and went up to the leafy fig tree in search of fruit, people far away had come to the temple hungry for an encounter with God. And despite seeing all of its elaborate architecture and decor, what they found was a leafy facade with no fruit. It was a money-making scheme fronting as a fountain of grace. I wonder how many people came to the temple around this time in hope of encountering the God of grace that they had heard about from far away, and experienced what was happening in the temple courts and, and, and thought to themselves, man, this is a leafy tree with no fruit. Maybe I'll just go somewhere else to try to satisfy the hunger that's inside of me. So here's what this means for us. To those of us who look to this passage as an excuse to go out and flip tables out there when anything makes us angry, here's what we have to remember. The only time Jesus flipped tables was when religious people made it hard for outsiders to draw near to God. That's the only time. Now, at too many churches today, when somebody far from God walks through the doors, they're met with a sense of shame because of where they're coming from. They are reminded in maybe the most unhelpful of ways that they have not been living as they should be. 
And that's just not what we see when we look at the person of Jesus, which is why here at the bridge, we've got this value that when anybody walks through our doors, we do not say, where have you been? We say, welcome home. This value means so much to me because it literally changed my life. I, I mentioned in high school, I became a Christian at the age of 17. Prior to that, I was an atheist. I was, I was not a nice atheist, by the way. There are nice atheists. I was not one of them. I would make fun of Christians, religious people, to their face for what they believed. I was deeply insecure, but it was a way for me to look down on people and see myself as better than these people. And so I'd criticize them. I'd say, religion is a crutch. You're weak. Why do you need God? Get over it. Don't you believe in science? This is how I conducted myself. God broke some things down in my heart and brought me to a place of like, I think I need something more than what I have. I think I need a hope that goes beyond where I'm currently at. And so I'd been invited to youth group by a friend who was pursuing me for the sake of Jesus a lot of times. And I'd said no over and over again because I was, that's a religion thing. It's a weak thing. But eventually I was ready to say yes. But the reason why I was so slow, one of the reasons I was so slow in accepting the invitation was because I knew if I attended this youth group, I'd have to come face to face with people that I had put down, I criticized. And I just came to terms with the fact, okay, I'm gonna have to own up to this. I'm gonna have to like wear the icy cold stairs and just endure it. And I remember walking into, it was actually a park, it wasn't a church, uh, it's part of the reason I came, because it was their meeting during the summer. And so I walked into the park, they're playing like ultimate frisbee and they got, some guy's got a guitar and whatever. And I remember walking up with just a sense of dread and the seeing people who I had made fun of and ready for what was coming my way. And instead of looks of shame and icy cold shoulders, I was greeted with hugs. People said, I'm so glad that you're here. And at dinner that night, well, like they got to Applebee's, you know, and like buy like the $3 appetizers or whatever. Remember, somebody's like, can we pray for the meal? And I've got like two wings in my mouth already. I'm like, yeah, definitely. We can pray for the meal. And they're like, let's pray. God, thank you for tonight. And thank you so much for bringing Corey. We've been hoping for a long time that he'd come. Amen. I was greeted not with a where have you been, but a warm, warm welcome home. And that's what we want to be here at the bridge. And the reason we want to be that way is because as we look at the Gospels, that's just what we see Jesus doing, welcoming people, not excluding them. So what makes Jesus so angry about what's happening in the temple? Exclusion. The second thing that makes him angry is presumption. So Jesus goes on to say that the temple has become a den of robbers, which is borrowing language from Jeremiah chapter 7. Now I'm going to read a few verses from Jeremiah chapter 7 so we can get the context of this. But I want you to imagine these uh, verses going through Jesus' head as he's standing the night before in front of the temple, imagining what he's going to do the next day. This is what Jeremiah says. <clears throat> this is God talking to his own people. Will you steal and murder? Commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal, who's like the local deity at the time, and follow other gods you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say, we're safe, safe to do all these detestable things. Has my house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Some people have looked at this den of robbers line that Jesus uses, and he's, uh, they're saying, uh, Jesus is accusing the religious leaders of stealing from people, right? Like, it's that price gouging. It, it, it's exploiting people who've come to the temple. But here's the deal. A den is not where robbers go to steal. A den is where robbers go after they're stealing to think, we're going to kick our feet up and we're safe. And Jesus is saying, these religious folks essentially spend six days a week living in a way that's totally contrary to the way that God commanded. They come to the temple, they drop some change in the bucket, they make some sacrifices, and they think, we're good. And Jesus responds with this, but I have been watching. Which has inspired our newest line of merchandise here at the bridge. I want to show it to you. This is called, um, uh, <laughs> I saw that Jesus. <laughs> you can get this as a poster or a t-shirt. Uh, or a car bumper sticker, and that uh, makes great Easter gifts. So I'm just saying, <coughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's not available. But Jesus' warning about seeing what we do is just as applicable today as it was then. The reality is too many church-going Christians are just Sunday Christians. We live six days like the rest of the world. We're selfish and angry with our spouse and our kids. We hoard money while people right in front of us go without. We ignore our neighbors we cheat on our taxes, we make underhanded moves in business, we jump into gossip conversations, and we stiff the wait staff who wait on us. And then we come to church and we say, but I've got Jesus. 
minutes. I'm good. I'm covered. And Jesus' response is, hey, I've been watching. Now, just to be clear, God's grace is vast. Amen? There's no sin that is too big for God's grace. There's no sin that he cannot cover past, present, and future. But what God does not tolerate is presumption because forgiveness enters through the door of repentance, not presumption. What's required is a heart of repentance. So the moment we think that grace is a license to live however we want is proof that we've actually fundamentally misunderstood grace, and it's an indicator that we likely are not nearly as safe as we think we are. Jesus has a low tolerance for this kind of presumption. Now, here's where uh, some of us need to re-examine how we spend our time and what we tend to critique. This is uh, a tendency in the church that's way too common where we point out what's wrong in the world and obsess over that rather than spend time looking at our own hearts. We tend to go out there and flip tables. This is an especially important reminder in an election year when there's going to be huge cultural pressures, billions of dollars, friends, spent on trying to polarize and demonize you. Many of us will be tempted to be consumed by the media cycle that's going to cover the ups and downs between now and November 5th, and we're going to be tempted to stress out like the future of the church rises or falls on that day. But we have to remember, the greatest threat all along to the church has never been from the outside. It has always been from the inside. So just look at Jesus' teaching, look at Paul's letters. They were living in a context that was much more hostile to the people of God than anything we experience, and yet they spend their time not criticizing the ways of the world, but calling the church to purity and fruitfulness. And so next time we're tempted to use this passage as a justification to go flip the tables of Democrats or Republicans or that person who would dare to vote for that candidate or that policy, what we have to remember is that when the only time that Jesus flipped tables was actually in his own house. It starts with home. So may we refuse to get tangled in the culture wars out there while failing to see the log in our own eye as Christians. After all, friends, how much more attractive would the church be if we spent just a fraction of the energy we spend now complaining about the things out there and start looking at our own hearts, the state of our own hearts, the state of the church? May it be, may it be said of us that we are more concerned with our own hearts than fighting culture wars. Verse 18. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. Now, surprisingly, the religious teachers are not big fans of Jesus interrupting their commercial operations. The irony here, though, is that the whole point of the temple, remember, was for there to be a pure place for God to dwell on earth with us. But then it became a place that was twisted for profit and power. And when Jesus, who's God in the flesh, enters the temple and he calls out what's been twisted, the religious leaders respond not with, how can we do better, but how, how can we kill him? The whole temple system was supposed to be about God and for God, and when God walks in and there's a threat to their religious system, they choose the system over God. And this wild scene with Jesus flipping tables and driving people out with the whips uh, ends with him leaving the temple with his disciples. Which leads us to the last part of our passage. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from its roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go and throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins." It's interesting, like, that's all good stuff, but it's weird here. It can be, like, it's, it's like the story takes one last strange turn. They leave the city, and they come across this fig tree, and Peter says, Rabbi, that's the tree you cursed. It's withered. But instead of talking about the fig tree or even the temple, Jesus starts musing about this new kind of faith community, one that is decentralized, that's not dependent on the temple, one that's characterized by faith and power in prayer, and forgiveness of others. And it's good, but it seems odd, like Jesus is just changing subjects. Jesus will go back into the temple one more time for one more day to do some more teaching, but then when he leaves again, it will be for the final time. This is what Mark tells us at the beginning of chapter 13. 
as Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? Replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Would you imagine for a second if you were a disciple of Jesus hearing Jesus say these words? Okay, he's just cursed a fig tree and you've watched it wither. And then after visiting the temple, Jesus says, see this building? It'll soon be a pile of rubble. What would would you be thinking? This has been the place where God has dwelled with his people for thousands of years. Just the one place on earth where he's promised to dwell. And now Jesus is saying, hey, it's going the way of the fig tree, by the way. And of course, what Jesus said would come true. If you know your history, just a few years later, AD 70, Rome would destroy much of Jerusalem, including the temple. And to this day, no temple stands in Jerusalem. So if you're hearing Jesus say this for the first time, you may, may well be thinking, if the temple's going away, then where do we go to meet with God? In the days that followed, Jesus would be arrested and beaten and crucified and left to die. And his disciples, you can watch this happen as you read, they slowly put together the fact that the old temple was going away because a new temple had come. The night before Jesus' death, he was gathered around an ordinary table with his disciples for one last meal together. And it was at this meal, Jesus declared something he called the new covenant. And in this new covenant, Jesus is the true and better temple where heaven and earth come together. In this new covenant, Jesus is the true and better priest, the one who mediates between us and God. In this new covenant, Jesus is the true and better sacrifice, the final lamb whose blood was shed, not for a few, but for the sins of the whole world. So the question is no longer where do we go to meet with God because Jesus has come and said, God has come to be with us. Because Jesus is the perfect once for all sacrifice, that means that those who trust in him for the forgiveness of sins do no longer wear the label of sinner. When God looks at us, friends, he sees somebody who has been perfectly washed clean of anything that could ever separate you from God. Which is why when that day called Pentecost comes, shortly after the day of resurrection, God looks out at this new community of followers of Jesus and said, I will make them my temple. I will be pleased to dwell in them. This is why those of us who are in Christ can say what was unthinkable before Jesus, that God is not just with us or near us, he is in us. So may we never fall into the trap of thinking that there's something special about a church building. Now, the church buildings that we worship in are a blessing. Don't get me wrong. We need physical places to gather. What I'm saying is there's nothing inherently magical about the brick and mortar we gather in. If you're here earlier this month, you remember we celebrated 20 years of God's faithfulness since the bridge started. And we kind of looked back on the story of where we had come from, and we remembered that this all began in a living room, friends. And then we met in a warehouse. And then the, the building you're in here, if you're in Spring Hill, used to be a vitamin powder factory. All right, if you're in Columbia, you're worshiping in a high school. And if you're at Murray County Jail or Perry County Jail, you're in an ordinary jail room in, in a jailhouse. The reason why this can be a place where God says, I am there is because you are there. Not because the building is special, but because God has said, you are special. He doesn't say, that's my building. He looks at us and says, that's my people. That's why church can happen anywhere. In fact, I would argue that all along, that's what Jesus intended to happen. You see, Holy Week, it started at a temple, but it ended at a table. You might say that, Jesus replaced the temple system with a table system. The table system, the temple system had this sort of centripetal force. It was a gravitational pull. It was come here to meet with God. And the new table system has this centrifugal force. It was missional sending. It's go and bring God out to the world so that they can experience him. Now, don't get me wrong, gathering is good. Gathering is good. The gathered people of God in large settings like this is important, but it is only part of what we do. If we are the body of Christ, this is the inhale. This is the gathering, but then we exhale. We exhale, and as we do, we go and we scatter and we bring the gospel to every table. So right now, friends, this is our inhale. But in a few moments will be our exhale. 
question is, what will you do with your exhale? Will you look at it as clocking out of church or will you look at it as clocking into mission? Jesus says, go, for I am with you. I, take me to the nations. Bring the gospel to every table. Break bread. Share wine. Declare and remind each other of the new covenant in my blood for the sake of the world. Take this news to a world that has been tired of seeing leaves and no fruit. Take me to a world that's hungry. So friends, next Friday and Saturday, we're gonna gather together and we're gonna celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus as the foundation of our life and hope. In anticipation of that, then how will you use the tables that you are at this week? Will you just go through the motions? Or will you see those tables as opportunities to invite people who are far from God to experience this church family? Because our deep hope is that next weekend we would see lots of people who are far from God come through these doors and they would hear God's voice and our voice say loud and clear, welcome home. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you came so that we might have perfect fellowship with you. You're the one who is the perfect lamb who takes away the sins of the world. And so we say thank you for that today. But you don't just invite us in, you send us out to go on mission to bring good news to a hungry world. So God, I pray simply that we be faithful with that. As we approach Easter, the best news of the world, God, I pray, I pray that we'd be bold. I pray that we'd use tables in our lives to fellowship with people who may never walk through the doors of a church aside from an initial relationship with one of us. So empower us, give us courage and conviction around that. Help us to love our neighbors whose names we may not know and help us to be bold in inviting people into this place that we love so that your kingdom can be advanced. Use us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We're now gonna celebrate communion. And as we do that, we remember that the foundation of everything we do is the cross and resurrection. As we take the bread, we remind ourselves that Jesus' body was broken for us. As we take the cup, we remind ourselves that his blood was shed for us. And so as the cups pass down the aisle, make sure to grab both uh, the bread and the juice and use this time to reflect and to pray. Praise God for what he's done in your life. Take this time to repent and say, God, I have strayed in this way. Forgive me. Come to the table of grace. Receive forgiveness and experience the God who has said the table is for you too. Hold on to the elements and uh, we'll receive them together towards the end of this next song. With that in mind, let's stand together now as we prepare for communion.
God, we have been wrong. Now we pray. Search us, know us, reveal the things we hide. Weaponize your word, commodify the cross. If we've silenced others' hurt, we've been guilty since the garden. We've been the whitewashed tomb, but God, you still forgive us. So we're turning back to you. Yes, God, you still forgive us. So we're turning back to you. Search us, know us, reveal the things we hide. Renew us, refine us, burn any ounce of pride. Lord, remind us you see us, even at our worst. Help us love, because you loved us first. Help us love, because you loved us. So we come to the table of Jesus. Well, Bridge family, we're, we're so glad that you... And we hear the words, my body broken for you. Let's receive the bread together. And the cup, where we hear my blood poured out for the remission of your sins. Let's receive the cup together. church. It's so good to worship together today. If you want prayer, our prayer team will be available up front as you go. May you be with Jesus and become like him for the sake of the world. Well, Bridge we'll family, we're so glad that you've tuned in today. And I just want to encourage you, if you sense God stirring anything in your heart during our time together, please go ahead and take a next step. We believe that every single person has a next step and we would be so honored to walk alongside you as you take yours today. So I want to encourage you to fill out our online connect card where you can let us know your information, let us know what God is doing in your life, and if there's any way that our prayer team can be praying for you this week. I love how technology is able to bring us together, but we want to say also, if you're ever in the Middle Tennessee area, we would love to invite you to join us in person. We know that community in a local church setting is so important. Even if you're not in the Middle Tennessee area, we would love to get you connected with a local church that's close to you so that you can continue your journey of being with Jesus and becoming like Him, all within the context of community. And last but not least, we know that the mission of the bridge is fueled by your generosity, and it helps us be able to reach our cities, the nation, and even around the globe. Yeah. Giving is a part of our worship to God. It is an opportunity for us to honor Him with what He has already given to us, whether you can give a lot or a little. So if you would like to participate in giving today, there are several ways that you can do that. And if you've already given, I want to say thank you. We have such an incredibly generous church family, and it is an honor and a privilege to be on mission together. I want to say this one last time, at least for today. Church family, we love you. Thank you so much for tuning in. We know God loves you so much more. Go be with Jesus and become like him for the sake of the world. And we'll see you next week. See you next week.
Bring the meat in.